to the Down Under edition of the OWASP DevSlop show. Today we're going to pop on our little uh, painter's berets because we are going to be looking at the InfoSec color wheel. We're going to be mixing some colors with Gael de la Cruz here today. Um, I'm joined by my lovely guests, Beck, James, and Lily. Hello, everyone. How are you this morning? Good. Yeah. I'm only sad that we didn't coordinate on the painter's beret thing as a bit yeah, of Yeah, I feel like I need a little striped shirt, maybe a little moustache, you know, just to really well, get James the Well, James is rocking those. James, yeah. can I show your moustache, please? <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure we can work something out. I would make a joke about being European, but I, I kind of do that a lot. So I'm just going to, like, do that this time. But, um, Coaching it in. Okay, thank you for my van bar. Um, all righty, Kyle, get, let's get stuck into it. Let's mix some colors. Tell us all about what this mysterious green team is. Oh, yeah. It's going to be like, okay, there's, <laughs> I'll have to like clarify like blue team, yellow team, and all those things. So I have this uh, prepared a short presentation or something. Yeah. Uh, but don't worry, it's not going to be that my PowerPoint because <laughs> I'd like to keep it like, you know, uh, light. And if you have like questions, just, you know, just throw it in okay so okay so this is the three points that i'm going to be talking about like what's a blue team then how do you get to join the blue team and then how can we combine our forces okay so i'm going to be covering these three aspects here so uh before i dive into it so let me just clarify um i have a hidden agenda every time i talk it's more of like i want to get people into the blue team so what's the blue team basically so blue team is uh, the team that deals with the defensive side of the infosec and i'm a blue teamer but i call myself like a blue teamer with a purple team mindset so what's like purple team so i keep on call <laughs> talking about colors so i talk about the blue team then there's also the red team red team think of it it's the uh, group that or the team that's dealing with the uh, offensive side like the attacking like simulated attacks okay and then when you say purple sort of like combining uh the aspects of the blue and the uh red team okay so okay so let me just clarify so what's a blue team okay so first of all i'd like to acknowledge the work of april wright because um she was the first one who started talking about the infosec color wheel okay and this uh so for those who remember from primary school the color wheel so we have all our color wheel in uh in arts but it's also applicable in uh the infosec side so Predominantly, when we talk about the blue team, uh, we're the defenders. And under the umbrella of the blue team, there are so many different uh, aspects of work that we actually do in terms of defending our environment, corporate environments. And there's actually a lot of acronyms there. So sometimes you'll hear the fear, which is basically for the digital forensics and incident response aspect of doing your defense and then we also need to have um credible threat intelligence so we call it ki cyber threat intelligence which is to dif differentiate it from other types of threat intel and then it, since we're doing the defensive work okay uh it's possible that uh, while you're doing your analysis you know you realize that oh uh this particular you know, um, intrusion actually like stem from, let's just say malware. And I want to understand the capability of this malware. So there's several ways on how you can do your analysis. So that falls under the MRE or malware reverse engineering. Okay. And then you also have what is called threat hunting. So, um, and then I'm, I'm going to like talk about threat hunting and SOC. Uh, uh, while I explain, like security operation center. So, so for a SOC, this is uh, basically this is a group of people who will be doing what or continuous monitoring. So the assumption here is that you have um, 
you're doing your logging and you have like different you know security tools there that will look at what is like evil or bad <laughs> like in your environment and provide you with alerts and you have to also make sure that when you talk about your tools you also like fine tune it because there's a potential that there may be false positives and it's like really something that you have to work hard in making sure that you uh, lessen your false positives because if you have too many alerts okay uh, that could lead to what is called an alert fatigue so predominantly uh, it has always been some sort of like reactive wherein there's an alert Okay, and then there's going to be some triaging. We have to figure out if it's false positive and if it's, you know, um, um, false positive. So, you know, you don't uh, really pay a lot of attention to that unless you're like really, really tracking your numbers. But, you know, you try to find out is it a true positive? And then from that, you know, uh, you try to understand what's happening and then uh, start looking around whether uh, from that particular uh, alert, you get some other indicators of compromise and then you actually consult, let's just say your um, threat intel team, like, hey, have you seen, let's just say this kind of you know, indicators? So the easiest indicators we look at, let's just say connection to an IP address, domain, but uh, the more difficult ones will be looking at the actual, let's just say uh, techniques used by attackers. There's like different frameworks available out there. Now, so that is more of the reactive side, but when we talk about threat hunting, this is something we're in, um, you start, you know, uh, with like a hypothesis, so you're hunting. So a hypothesis is basically a um, statement that you can later prove or disprove. So it's not a theory. So I've always had this thing whenever I, you know, I, I love watching uh, crime shows, all those, you know, uh, detective, uh, detective shows. Okay, uh, these are... Uh, the detective uh, shows they always like say like oh I have a theory this is you know uh, something that uh, you know I'm I think the perpetrator did this and all those things but but it's not to be a theory it's a hypothesis so threat hunting is like you have a hypothesis it could be that uh, there could well, let's look at whether there is um, a potential attacker moving laterally so you have that hypothesis and then you try to find out like uh, how, how, how will they move laterally let's just say in our environment and you start looking at your uh, telemetry okay so oh uh, another thing that i want to also point out okay in terms of the infosec wheel okay so you basically started with basic of like the blue and the red team and then with the work of April right, you have that infosec wheels where there's this other colors for other different teams or like think of them like functions, okay? And just to clarify, because I'm dealing with, uh, it's this is dev slop, uh, for clarification, every time I talk about endpoint, I'm actually talking about a standalone system. So it's either a host, workstation, okay? Because it could be that from somebody from a, uh, development background when they hear endpoint they're thinking about api endpoint but for me as a blue team yeah I take this uh, standalone system now with this okay so it's actually quite useful uh to think of the csf which is the cyber security framework like what are the things that you know uh we're basically doing in the blue team side so so uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that the CSF is actually a framework from the NIST, and it's composed of five concurrent and continuous functions. Okay. So we have here like the five functions: you have identify, you know, pro uh, identification. There, you're, you have the uh, protection or protecting, and then you have the detect function, respond and recover. So, uh, first of all, I need to clarify that um, you have to know what you have in your environment because how can you protect something if you're not aware of what you have in your environment? So, that's why it's very important that first you identify what needs the protection. Yeah. Uh, 
like you know what are the systems available there assets there and then part of identification is also identifying uh what's the governance framework you know in your business environment and the context that your you know that your organization or even if think of it like your team the context that you are uh, operating under okay and then you have there the protect of course this one uh when we think about protection we always think about uh, what are the safeguards that we can put in place to protect, you know, your assets? So you've already identified your assets. Then what are the safeguards that we need to develop, put in place? And part of your safeguard will be, okay, providing awareness and training. So that's also important. So sometimes people get so hung up about, oh, we have the latest tool out there, but we forget about the human aspect, okay, and our end user, you know. So, and then um, the third function here is, you know, um, detection, meaning we will have uh, activities that will help us identify uh, cybersecurity events. I, I think the fonts are like too small, but I just want to clarify things at this point because uh, people sometimes get confused about terminology. So when we talk about events, okay, it basically means something is observable. So... Um, it could be like you look at the log, okay, and then there's an event, meaning uh, a user um, connected to a particular, uh, you know, let's just say there's a domain or there's an IP address. So that's something observable. Or a user visited the web website. So that is something observable. That is an event. And then you will now have to make a determination, okay, in terms of this uh, observable, you know, event, this event that happened, um, is this something that will affect the security triad, triad? You know, you have your CIA, confidentiality, okay, integrity, availability. So if, let's just say, this particular uh, event uh, breaks that uh, triad, then you call it an incident. Okay, because uh, you will see some the acronym, especially when you're in the blue team, you have there, or you're new to blue team, uh, S-I-E-M. So you have, uh, it's um, all these, uh, think of it, it's a tool wherein it gets all the different, you know, logs, okay, and then there is some uh, engine, an analytical engine, and based on the rules or heuristics, there's a determination on whether the event is, you know, something that is suspicious, and then you get an alert. Okay. So, and then um, going through this function, so let's just say there's a uh, detection, meaning there is a determination, hey, there's really an incident. Okay. Then we need to make sure that we react or respond appropriately. So um, you need to make sure that you have techniques that will help you contain the impacts of the incident. So um, under the blue team umbrella, you have uh, the FEAR, Digital Forensics Incident Response. So generally, when we talk about digital forensics, think of it, it's like you're doing archaeology, <laughs> okay, finding artifacts on a system. And, and then the incident response aspect is utilizing all these uh, knowledge, skills, you know, from digital forensics in terms of analyzing this, uh, you know, what you can get out of, let's just say, your different tools because there's an incident and you're responding to your incident. And when we talk about incident response, there's several phases there. So by itself, uh, incident response has several phases. And uh, before you actually, uh, hopefully, before you get to this point where in uh, you're responding to an incident, you have uh, an incident response plan because a plan is important so that people are not running around like headless, you know, chicken or something. <laughs> so they know, like, what are they supposed to do? Okay, and when you have a plan, you have to make sure that uh, for those uh, people who are part of the team doing the response, you got to make sure that they're aware of what's in the plan. And it's a living document, and it has to be tested regularly. Okay, And then also part of the phase of the incident response is actually the, this part uh, recovery. 
Okay, so for the CSF, you have the recovery period here wherein we're talking about improving the resiliency of the uh, organization or restoring, you know, services. If there are certain services that were affected because of the incident, you should be able to restore that. Okay, so this is uh, basically the CSF. And I like talking about the CSF because it's sort of like from perspective of the blue team, these are the things that we are, you know, um, doing but i'd also like to highlight if you are coming from a red team perspective you are also basically doing some of the functions here so i think we have some uh you know uh people from like uh pen testing background from red team you could like you know pipe in and if you want to add something here I am caught up in the conversation about whether availability <laughs> incidents are incidents or not. Prompt okay. me again. Prompt me again. <laughs> oh no, Beck, your mic's gone weird again. Oh no. I'll sort that out. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe it's an intentional effect. But yeah, so this is a defensive framework, right? Um yes. when we're talking about this kind of thing. And is there is there really a space for red teaming for offensive stuff in this framework? Well, for me, in terms of uh, the identification, like so, I've talked about like the systems and assets. So think of it mm. from the perspective of uh, when you're doing your pen testing, depending on the scope. So you have your reconnaissance. But of course, you have to basically identify what you're supposed to be testing. And then you are actually also looking at identifying if there's any you know, vulnerabilities. And then from that, I think from that particular angle, it helps us in the blue team understand, OK, so we have this. So what are we supposed to be doing to make sure that an actual attacker doesn't leverage that? So I believe that no matter like what's your team color or something, everybody contributes, and it's good to have everybody, you know, be able to talk about what they do. And and for me as a blue teamer, I actually hang around with a lot of pen testers. I just like listen to everything and like yeah yeah sort of like yeah I'm learning because like I'm, I'm okay. I'll give an example. Like for example, um, when I'm analyzing you know, a uh, particular system like artifacts, I sometimes think from an attacker mindset, I'm the attacker, so what am I, you know, going to do with this? It's like, I'm like trying to imagine, you know, what's their intention and all those things. And based off, out of that, like, kind of thinking, I now go back, like, in terms of, you know, the forensics artifacts. So how did I know they got in here? Okay, I look at the logs, you know, you have, like, different event IDs, and then... Uh, if I'm, attack, I'm an attacker and I want to stay here, you know, I, I got in, but I want to stay here. So persistence. So I look at persistence mechanisms, you know, like, for example, uh, I'm going to like uh, but do like a scheduled task or something. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so it's like, it's a good conversation that I always have. And then I, I, I really love listening to people's like stories. Yeah. And also, um, I think, yeah, I think the interoperability thing is really important, just making sure that everybody's communicating with everybody and that broadly this is a really good way to think about security because so often we get really compartmentalized and siloed and we don't talk. Um, but I also wanted to, um, I started this conversation in the chat because I thought it was a little bit of a tangent and I didn't want to interrupt your flow, but I think that it is worth discussing a little bit about the CIA trial when we're talking about detecting. <laughs> um <laughs> The thing I have the most arguments with people about is whether availability, like the A in CIA, um, whether that kind of stuff should be qualified as an incident or an event all of the time. Because from the point of view of the people reporting those things to me, they are really like often little outages and people get a lot of reporting fatigue from that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, yeah, the outages are just really short or they only mm -hmm. affect a small component but this is also why i think the availability incidents that are actual incidents where you have people deliberately blocking things or taking things down they're the sneaky ones people forget about them because they're not like a data breach so mm. they aren't always front of mind for a lot of folks do you think mm. how, yeah. how should we how should we break that down to stop people getting that kind of fatigue around reporting these sorts of things um so we we want to uh, um, go back again to like you know 
in terms of your IR plan. So, of course, I'm going to talk about it from an incident responder perspective. Yeah, for sure. So, part of the IR plan, you have your uh, classification, like, you know, like the severity levels, priority levels, and all, all those things. So, you will have, like, certain metrics. So, if you actually are uh, look, thinking of, like, from an availability side, because from an incident response perspective, perspective the availability most of the incidents about availability is about the ddos type of attack so that's really massive or it could be you know now i've actually seen we're in um instead of ransomware it's like sort of like we will ddos you so i've just shown you that you say this is our capability okay and we're able to take oh no my cloud flare <laughs> ow right where it hurts i'm so scared <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna like name you know vendors and all those things, but that's like you know uh, particular you know uh, type of attack. So in that case, yes, availability is really impacted because you actually have an active group or you know um, threat actor that's really targeting the availability of your sites, you know the services that you offer. So that is really an incident. Now, from a perspective of, let's just say, um, if like, you have to clarify like outages, like what is your, think of it as like your metrics, your availability and all those things, because we cannot have what, 100% uptime, right? So all those numbers, like what, uh, we could like just say like up to four nines or something. So, so you just have to have the metrics, and I know uh, things have really progressed. So I've been in tech for um, ever since the start of this century. So I shifted careers. Yeah. So and <laughs> and yeah, I frame it like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I frame it like that. Yeah. yeah I, I frame it like that because I remember before when I first got my Hotmail account. When the login page, okay, it was like Ooh, loading. Hot mail. <laughs> <laughs> so five minutes for it to load, okay. Yeah. So th that's why I, I think I'm like really patient because of like that kind of you know uh, growing up with the internet kind of thing. Like just you know how long it, it, it took me to just actually land just to lend account. some data to what you're saying there. Um, when I did my digital visual, visual media course at university, the guideline for a page load was like two to three seconds before a user would become impatient. Mm -hmm. And now it's actually like, no joke, they basically like, if it takes more than a quarter of a second, it's considered slow. I love slash hate that. I yeah, actually love I, hate that. That broke my brain totally. Cause I'm like, that's an immeasurable amount of time. But anyway. <laughs> I think, it is real, I think what you're saying. Like, to kind of roll everything up that, that we're talking about here, and I kind of mentioned it, mentioned it in the chat as well, this is where like um, DevSecOps kind of starts getting a little bit sure. muddled because it's all about context, right? Like we have availability incidents and sometimes they're reliability incidents and sometimes they're security incidents. So I think like what you said, Guy, like having a strict, or not a strict, but like a clear definition of what is an incident um, and what's a security incident um, and what's the reliability incident will really kind of help people figure that out. Because, I mean, I've had that. I'm on the blue team. I've had that situation in my job as well where people are like, oh, this this thing is down, like security help. And I'm like, what do you want me to do with this? Like there's no, there's no bad going on here. It's just right. bad code. Um, and from a reliability and perspective too, like all of these things would be reliability incidents regardless of the security context, like, you would still 100%. be tracking them in the reliability yeah. space. So, so I think, yeah, like, yeah, with SRE becoming like a more like prolific role, like I think every availability incident would fall under a reliability incident. And then a subset of that would be potentially right. security incidents where I can't help bring things back online. I can't help like, you know, actually like get the availability back. But what I can do is try to get to the root cause of what happened. Um, yeah. So I think, I think so because that way. Sitting, uh, sitting on the network doesn't keep causing more availability. Yeah. Issues. yeah. I think the other thing that's really interesting is that I, I think when you're talking about like web testing within the context of incident response and that as well, one of the things that I think is really undervalued uh, when we do pen testing and when we're writing up our reports is helping developers understand what sort of stories to tell when it comes to 
what an incident looks like for a web app because I feel like we always sort of come back to an incident is when um, like data is breached or some other very um, like I don't want to say the word catastrophic, but I feel like for the people who have their data breached, it can be quite catastrophic. And we don't build, we don't build um, like logging, monitoring, alerting around um, all of the steps that are taken before you actually hit the main database. Like we, it's very rare that I've seen, you know, any sort of event generation for, hey, we've noticed that, you know, there's a lot of XSS coming in, or we've noticed there's some really unusual behavior on certain forms, or we're seeing, you know, people typing in wacky operating system like commands, and they're filtering through somewhere, we seem to always rely on logging and monitoring and event generation when it comes to, like, lateral movement, and we sort of forget about generating events on our perimeters or on our inlets, I guess, is a good way to frame it. Um, so I think going back to your original question, Guile, I feel like that's one thing that we could, as red teamers or pen testers do better is really help uh, improve our own way of talking about what improvements need to be made or where they can be made. Um, I don't know if uh, like, any of you have had a similar experience though? Okay. Um, I totally agree with you. Yes. Sometimes, you know, there's this incident and then if you, if you know about, if let's just say this particular organization may have had like, you know, uh, pen testing done. And then if you're, if you're in the organization that also did that pen testing and you're collaborating with your, um, other colleagues, you know, sometimes what happens like, okay, they've been, you know, breached and this is our finding. And then, you know, uh, water cooler talk and then they, and then somebody from the red team, oh yeah, we actually pointed it to them like last year out of the test, like, <laughs> yeah, you could actually like just say like, uh, please implement, you know, uh, the recommendation from like, you know, pen test. So, and and once again, if you're like from a consulting, you know, background and all those things, it really helps to also talk to the other, you know, teams there. So, you know, yeah. unless there's like that, you know, NDA for the red team that they're not supposed to talk about this and all those things. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It, and I really think, you know, everybody, you know, in the same, you know, like the team, the organization and all those things. If you're, um, because there's, Okay, let me just clarify, because there's a possibility that uh, you're all, uh, let's just say, uh, working internally, your internal, you know, like in internal security team. So it makes it easier to talk. But there's also the possibility that uh, they're getting like external, you know, uh, security service provider. So and then in that case, it's really siloed. And what will happen is that maybe while well, you're talking to your client, and let's just say I'm I come in as, you know, um, a consultant and talk and, you know, help you with your incident. And then when I talk about, okay, we found this, blah, blah, blah. And then sometimes it's possible that, you know, they just like look at you and just like, uh, uh, okay. And someone will, you know, say like, oh yeah, we know about that. Uh, it's like, it's been identified. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's on the backlog. There's a ticket. It'll pop up eventually. Just wait for it to get a few votes. It'll end up on the next sprint. It's fine. Yeah. But on that note, um, and trying not to, I, I feel like I've completely derailed your presentation, Guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm afraid to. Anyway, welcome to the show. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, let's let's. I think we've talked about red teaming um, enough, but when we're talking about green teaming, red yeah. doesn't come into it. Just from a color wheel perspective, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. What? Well, um, yeah. What's so, what's green teaming then? Uh, okay. So I'm like getting ahead of my slides, but it's <laughs> okay. So I'll get that. Okay. So I'll get back to my presentation. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. Uh, that's okay. our way of segueing and saying, sorry, we all have the spree speedy brain go-go's and we derail. <laughs> so now we coming back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right back uh, on topic. Was, yeah. So I'm just going to like, just, 
cover this briefly because I also want to like, you know, like my hidden agenda of getting ev everybody to consider moving to the blue team. So these are like the different, you know, areas, functional areas under the blue team. And in terms of the temporal relationships, so you have like Threat Intel providing, you know, um, visibility on what are the different uh, let's just say threat actors that may be targeting your organization. It could be it's like you know industry specific, and then um, that's sort of like future oriented. And then digital forensics, as I mentioned before, it's more on like you're being uh, an archaeologist. You're looking at something that happened in the past. Okay. Now the present one. So you have like the SOC. You talk about like you know the events, you know incidents, alert triaging. Then you have your threat hunting that's like continuously uh, happening in your organization. And then you have an incident response because you found out something that's you know really an incident, and you're trying to make sure that you contain you know the incident. It doesn't like you know let's just say if it's ransomware, you don't want it to spread. So you have like you do quarantine. Uh, you do like quarantine. It could be like network isolation. Okay, so okay now, uh, so I'm just gonna make it like really, uh, you know, like talking about like how to you join the blue team. Okay, uh, it's about like passion, interest in terms of uh, defending, protecting organizations. Okay, and um, a lot of people sometimes wonder, wonder, or ask me like, um, how do I get in there? So um, these are the potential paths you know pivot from it so it could be like you come from a networking background server system administration network security even if you say like you come from a development background yes you can like pivot into you know the blue team side others like i'd like to point out um when i first moved to tech i was really interested in security and that time it was just network security you have your firewalls uh routers Okay, um, and in terms of the firewalls and uh, routers, that was like all we, we thought of in terms of network security. And largely because there were not really a lot of, you know, uh, not a lot of training available. But right now, there is a lot of training that I've seen. So some universities have started offering specialization in cybersecurity, even, you know, digital forensics, okay? And then uh, other potential uh, move is, for example, I've seen uh, people from a law enforcement background, so they, they did like digital forensics, then they started moving into incident response, so that's one potential path. Others could be like social sciences, so if you come from a, you know, social science background, so it could be like you got trained as an intelligence analyst, Okay, and then you can move into uh, the blue team sites, specifically focusing on, let's say, uh, cyber threat, cyber threat intelligence. Yeah. So this one, I know it. I, I don't know whether it will come as a shock to you, but it's just like I'm being very upfront that, you know, like in terms of getting to the blue team, because there's a lot of you know skill sets. Um, it may it may seem overwhelming, but uh, the positive thing here is that if you come from other, you know, fields, you know, backgrounds, there's always an application. I mean, the interest is there, okay? It's just knowing how to use the tools, what tools to use. Yeah, so um, anyone wants to... Yeah, I think I just wanted to make a comment about like the potential paths. And I think this is something I speak to a lot of people who are new to the industry altogether um, about. And I think that one kind of harsh reality is that there aren't a lot of entry level jobs into blue team unless you are lucky enough to get a grad position with maybe a, a big four consulting company or something like that. Um, and I think a lot of people need to understand that it is a very, very valid and good path to pivot in from IT. And um, I personally think that I did myself not a disservice, but I could have benefited from spending some more time in general IT practice um, instead of hopping straight into blue teaming because I felt like I was making recommendations about technologies that I hadn't configured myself. Um, so luckily my husband is, is his admin, so I just like picking his brain all the time. But um, 
yeah, I think that like a lot of people worry and they say like, oh, but you know, I didn't, I don't have any specialist training or like, I'm just a, like a network engineer. Or I'm a, you know, a Dev, DevSecOps person or just a DevOps person. Like, what can I do? It's not going to look good on my resume. I beg to differ. I think it would look really good on your resume to have that experience, if that makes sense. As, as someone though, who, who worked for a really long time as a sysadmin, I, I would actually, if you can steal the brain knowledge of someone who's done it that's better because you don't get the related uh, trauma so that's good (laughs) so basically you're saying i skipped the trauma and and just zapped the knowledge good move i feel like it's one of those things when you've worked in an adjacent or even like a completely different industry for some time you become more familiar with, you know, how businesses work and how all of the competing priorities come into it or how, you know, how to deal with people and get them on your side so you can, um, you know, achieve the goal that you're looking uh, to get to. Whereas I think when you dive straight in, you don't really have that understanding of business sometimes. Like I think there are lots of people who have gone directly in and you can learn it on the job, but I think sometimes there are some really harsh lessons that you need to learn. Um, yeah. And I think that it comes back to what you were saying, James, of like you can you can learn it and you can sort of skip the trauma at the same time. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My spicy take about this is that I think anyone getting into any security team at all should spend at least a little time building something and like on on some kind of Fair app point. or system development team i know that not everybody does i feel like that's valid too but i also feel like the the perspectives and experience that you can bring are really um probably a, you know more informed in a lot of ways by having had that experience and you may understand or not even it may have a bit more empathy i think for the 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 problems that people can face yeah, when they're in those teams definitely. having to build things and make trade-offs and and all of that kind of stuff i think that's one of the things right is that when you go through courses or when you go through a lot of the material that's available for free online everything is presented as a very black and white decision this is how you do security this is how you don't do security but the problem is is that unless you're doing greenfields projects you don't have those black and white decisions everything is a shade of gray and sometimes you need to sorry Lily you go you go no no I'm sorry I interrupted you I was just going to say, and like, and this is, I think, part of the the trouble is that we don't have empathy for the developers who have been dropped into these like archaic environments and they're trying to make the best decision for like whatever their their professional function is, whether they're SREs, developers, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have the security person, whatever your function is being like, that's not the right decision. But you don't really, very often you'll see the there is no right decision, but it's just security sort of standing there being like, that's not secure. Like this it. is secure. Yeah. 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 And when it's not a greenfield environment, like, like you were saying back, um, you really have to contend with the fact that things are already in a state that's not ideal. And then you have to prioritize. Like if you're in an environment, like it's had a lot of legacy stuff and also lots of cultural team practices where people are just like, I'll check this secret in because it's not a prod secret. So I don't care. Um, working to prioritize what you've got and, and working to change the culture. Like that's not something you can come in and mandate. And I mean, you can try, but people are not going to listen to you. Um, so it takes time and it takes a lot of getting to know people and a lot of being able to relate to them and probably work with them Mm. and prioritize all kinds of other things. So having that experience and understanding where they're coming from, from a real like practical point of view, I think is a real asset. And, and pivoting from IT is one of the best ways you can do it. There's a good okay. comment in the chat too, just w- what you're saying, Lily, um, which is I'm just going to disappear you for a second. Um, yeah, it, I think that's a great yeah. comment. Because yeah, it, it, budget, totally. And it's it's like you can't, you can't secure a product that hasn't been built because you spent all your time 
just your <laughs> security. It's like, congrats, you have a sock. We don't actually have a product that we can generate yeah, events. And we have no through. customers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of side note, but this is also why I hate people who get on the internet. I mean, people who get on the internet, oh my God, who would be one of those? <laughs> but also... Um, people who get on particularly on Twitter and be like, well, I don't understand why everybody doesn't do this. So like, Oh my God, you're not using X. How dare, like you're doing it all wrong and making like very big blanket judgments about somebody's maturity in the security space without, because they're not doing it the right way. They're not doing it the orthodox way, which is something that is like nice if you can get it. But I think anybody who lasts long enough in security will realize it's all trade-offs and there are some things that are not attainable and you have to balance things against other things. It's just the reality of, you know, the world. I, I guess, oh, sorry, Guile. Oh, I just want to, like, it's sort of just going to take us a little bit off tangent, but kind of related to what <laughs> you're saying. Like, um, in terms of, like, the training potential paths, you know, you have, like, you know, all those, let's just say, boot camps, training, and all those things. But what I feel is that it doesn't give uh, people who want to move into this industry, or let's just say somebody who's like, you know, a student in the uni, like the real life experience. And I feel like uh, for me, like, you know, in an ideal world, we you have internships, okay, so that it gives uh, the uh, these people who are undergoing training or studying, you know, the experience, a real world experience, and not just like, okay, go go grab some coffee for the entire team. It's something that, you know, that's like part of the team and something maybe that, you know, uh, apprenticeship. So I know it's going back to the old fashioned way or like in the olden days where in you have like an apprenticeship and all those things. So to really get that experience, to see what's happening. Because sometimes it could be like, okay, you have these materials. And from what I'm like seeing, sometimes the materials in the school is like outdated and not that, you know, practice in the, you know, industry. So I get that industry experience. Anyway, go ahead, Beck. Yeah. Oh, no, I was actually going to ask, and I feel like this is a really good segue into it. For people who are either pivoting or they have somehow found their way into blue teaming as their first job like what can they do to to help cope with the stress and the pressure of incident response and always sort of having to be switched on and ready for action like what can they do and I guess the other side of that is what can businesses do to make sure that their whole teams but in question. particular <laughs> their young members are supported because like I feel like there's always I feel like there's more that we can do to, to prevent fatigue from responders. And I think it's really important. Like, I don't know, I'm not in those teams, but I have a lot of feelings about it. I also feel like it's one of those questions that if you answered it well enough, you could probably retire on the answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we always come into these things trying to like solve neat small things? And yeah. We, I don't know. Yeah. Huge industry-wide discussion point. Let's go. Yeah, just answer yeah. it two two seconds, Guile. That's what we've got. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How do we solve no security right now? Oh my god! It's, it's, there, okay, it's not like two seconds. There's like several <laughs> aspects there. Like okay, uh, first okay. Uh, so I talk about the alert fatigue. So I'm a fan of like really, you know, uh, fine tuning things. Doesn't mean that let's mm. just say the security tool vendor said, oh, this is going to solve all your problems. And then here, like, you, yeah, we have our magic, you know, uh, AI, you know, engine and all those things. And then once you put it in production, it's like suddenly there's like this alert. So you really have to understand your environment, you know, know your environment and then fine tune that, lessen that alert fatigue. Uh, and then in terms of getting adequate rest, because, um, uh, speaking of fatigue, I, I've seen some organizations where in part of their incident response plan, there's a fatigue policy. Like if there is a, you know, high priority, high severity incident, like maximum hours that, you know, someone will uh, work on that incident is just, let's mm. just say 10 hours, or it could even be just like eight hours. Okay. And then you really send them home, make sure that, you know, uh, they're well rested. And the other is for organizations with a global outreach, we're in, they follow the sun. So 
we're here in Australia, so because we're in Australia, like if it's like a US based company, all those shenanigans happen at their night and then we have to like respond. And then after that, like make sure that we have a handover to the next geo, the next area. And then making sure that we have uh we aside from the fatigue policy of hours, like if let's just say you're in a stock environment, make sure that let's uh you don't work people let's just say uh 12 days in a row or like i've, I've been in an environment that in a sock but sort of like kind of like a knock kind of thing where it's like three weeks of without you know without a break or something that's like you have to have like those rests and um make sure that uh it's okay for the team to say you know like build a culture of like saying that it's okay to say that i'm sorry i just like have to go or have like mm-hmm. leaves and it, sometimes it's kind of difficult to actually get leaves you have to like justify things because sometimes people just need a break yeah yeah i was I thinking that. was thinking about how um in you know last december 20 what year is it 2021 last year when um the log for j zero day vulnerabilities <laughs> dropped like one right after the other and it really i know i've cursed this conversation now i'm so sorry and they and they they dropped one after the other and i don't know how many people got sleep in december but particularly for the last three weeks of it um i'm lucky enough to work for an organization like in a security team in an organization that is global and we can do follow the sun kind of stuff so at the end of the day, you'd hand over to Europe and they'd hand over to the US who would hand back over to us in the morning. And it was just, you know, keeping that information going was really good. But that is in every organization. So being super honest and upfront about where you're at. And, and I think what you were saying, Gail, about creating that culture in your team is super important. If people are assuming other people are like all 22 years old with no other responsibilities in their lives and endless energy and fully like able-bodied and everything else then you know maybe you can just have another can of red bull and keep going but that's not most people (laughs) so making sure that we understand that reality is just yeah imperative if we're going to do this right and not burn people out i think yeah totally, totally correct I think also like it's just good business sense as well. Even if you're like an evil uh, corporation and you don't care about your people, if you care about security and you care about your product, it just makes business sense to have um, your employees being like top of their A game, well rested so their brains are working. Otherwise, they're going to make mistakes. Um, And I I just want to make a comment about like, this fatigue, this alert fatigue at something else that I deal with or or have heard people deal with um, in the blue team is also like maintaining a heightened state of vigilance all the time can be really tiresome. So like I know um, particularly in the threat intel space, but even just like in most like SOC situations, people feel like they need to know what's going on in the threat landscape all the time. Um, because, you know, you'll log in in the morning and maybe like some leadership person will send you a message, be like, did you see this article? Like, and, um, you know, you haven't even like woken up yet properly. Um, I think that it's really important for me personally to make a clear distinction between work and non-work time. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just kind of like want to start a conversation about that, um, So we're talking about follow the sun models, doing handovers and things like that. Um, But I personally don't look at Twitter or any like security news or anything like that outside of business hours. Um, And I make sure that people know that. Like if you want me to have like seen an article over the weekend, you are dreaming because I have better things to do with my time. Like you don't have to constantly like live, breathe, eat and shit security all the time to be good at your job. Um, Psychologically, too, there's just so much uh, stuff out there that you can read about the long-term effects of doing this. Um, and oh, really? it's one of those areas where, okay. uh, especially if you look in the reliability space, hmm. basically these problems exist uh, in SRE, um, sysadmin, and they've existed for a very long time uh, in the same way they've existed in the security space for a very long time. Um, but it's one of those things where I think there's probably not enough cross-pollination between those disciplines. Like hmm. there's solutions to problems like this, for example, if you even go back to like the ITIL v3 framework, mm-hmm. just for the olds, um, <laughs> and you start looking at the definition of incidents versus problems, um, as an yeah. example, like if you view security incidents as incidents and you only ever view them as incidents, you never start looking for the patterns and the root causes and fixing those, you mm. are going to burn people out. 
And that's yeah. true in the reliability yeah. space. Um, you know, like if, for example, like, hey, we don't have an IDS of any sort on our network. We keep getting breached. <laughs> maybe we'll <laughs> buy the IDS so we're not just paging people constantly. I don't know. Maybe that'll help us out. Like there's things you can do to actually add some maturity to like your detection and response capabilities that mean you're not actually relying on individual responders as much. Um, I think the other thing is sort of going back to the people component of it and spending all of your time in these like news articles or trying to learn about like what's going on. I feel like as well it really, um, I think it increases the rate and the um, impact of things like imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. um, which really has a, a detriment to like on the job performance. And it's 100%. one of those things that I say, like I've, I've had a couple of mentees before and the thing that I said to them was like, don't spend all of your time outside of work learning and building and doing all of this stuff. Like if you want to spend a couple of weekends doing that, that's absolutely fine. But yeah. don't let it define your personality because what will happen is when you're at work and something goes wrong, it will suddenly turn into I'm terrible at everything because I've made my job right. my identity. And it's like, you know, if, yeah. if you have hobbies outside of work that you excel at and you do really well, it gives you something to go back to and, and enjoy. And, like, you can you can be good at that or you can be mediocre and it doesn't matter. Um, and yeah. it means yeah. when you go to work and fail or something goes wrong, you're just like, oh, that's okay. I am a fully, you know, functioning, <laughs> faceted person. Being. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Particularly stuff outside of screens. Like, uh, I mean, doesn't mean that screen mediated hobbies are less legitimate. And I think mm -hmm. particularly because we're still in a pandemic, screen mediated everything mm -hmm. is going to be our reality for a really long time. But yeah, like cooking or knitting or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever fits you, um, yeah is really good and also you know in the event of the apocalypse where we don't have computers something that will make you a really valuable addition to a team um yeah. but the, the other thing is you know tech is one of those industries where i think it's one of the very few where people will go and try and do their jobs for free on weekends just tech mm -hmm. broadly um mm -hmm. there's that old adage of like well doctors don't go home and perform surgery on the weekends one because it's hella illegal but two um they got lives they go to do other stuff but they also yeah. have jobs that in, like include real like expertise and they yeah they're not going to go practice that on the weekends well and let's like, face it they're not very adventurous right like <laughs> well, I, I think it's important to break things up right like you need to spend time in different areas of your brain and if you're constantly in the task slash doing area of your brain you're going to be burnt out no matter what that's why when you take a break you're like you're not supposed to be scrolling on your phone or reading reddit because that's not a mental break you're still mm -hmm. consuming information and I personally find that very overwhelming. Um, yeah, we're called out by this conversation. So. Hey, yo, um, <laughs> but this kind of like leads into the conversation about um, like taking a risk-based approach when we deal with incidents and alerts. So, it, you know, I think that if you have top-down support from the business to say mm -hmm. that like this is what a low, medium, high severity incident is, and this goes back to your point, Guy, about your incident response plan, you can point to the plan and say, this is a low severity alert. I don't need to worry right now. Or yeah, it's a problem um, and I need to do something about it, but it's not panic mode time. And if anyone mm -hmm. else tries to make you panic about it, you can just point back to the framework and say, actually, I can deal with this in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like the, the good fallback on that. Um, and it kind of like feeds into as well, like making sure that postmortems are blameless because once you have that framework, it becomes less about the person and, yeah. and, and more about the process and the framework. Um, and, and so that you, you like, you, like you said, Beck, you don't like, um, and Lily, you don't wrap your identity up into like how good you are at your job, because it's not about a mental decision that you made, you were following a process. Um, yeah. And this is, this is one of the things I really like about Beth, your mic. Oh, your mic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, let's go back to Guy. <laughs> so that's all Computers. great point, Mimi, and it just brings me to the you know it was like really great timing because this is about now 
the green team how can we combine our forces so that's a perfect you know like lead up to it so uh so i've talked about uh the blue team okay like a little bit about the red team so in the infosec color wheel there's a yellow team so what's the yellow team these are you the builders the developers you're the the software engineers and architects and i'm gonna get you know like say publicly i love developers my high school uh, best friend the one who encouraged me to move to the tech space yeah she was a developer but there's like some other reasons why she she dropped out of the industry but yeah anyway so when you're in this thing of it you're a builder so what has traditionally been the focus okay uh it's uh basically on the requirements of the business Okay, and what are the technical requirements? And then what are the functionality, you know, and user experience? So I've talked about a little bit about, you know, uh, the user experience earlier and James pointed out all those numbers. And then it's about also the performance of your, you know, product or the application. And this has traditionally been, you know, the focus. Now, the challenges here is that you know, the security issues are only discovered, let's just say, uh, by the red team, pen testers, when they're doing their pen testing. Or in the case of us, the blue teamers, we only find out about the issue when there's an intrusion, which could possibly be uh, we are alerted or we, because we found out through threat hunting that there is like, you know, an attacker that's active in our environment could be like discovered months later. So these are the challenges. And that's why okay, I'm like really happy that, you know, uh, I got invited here uh, and to talk about like the green team. So how do we all work together? So um, so the blue, the blue team will help the yellow team uh, understand the threats, like what we've seen. It will help them uh, build, you know, better threat models. Okay. And then provide. Uh, we will also provide the blue teamers will provide the defensive security output and then how does the yellow team if the builders help us so i talk about like you know the false positives all those things so we build better tools and at the same time in terms of uh be helping us uh build automation capabilities so that will really help us as defenders and it will really improve the monitoring and defense capability. So when we talk about green team, we're now combining, you know, blue team and yellow team, you know, um, activities wherein uh, the green team will, you know, use automation, you know, help us with our uh, monitoring defensive capabilities. And then also with the use of secure coding practices, like the feedback from us, like, or like telling them like, oh, here are the uh, threats we've seen and all those things. So help them, uh, also you know uh create good threat models so, so if you had a devsecops engineer let's say would they fall into the green team i believe that, that would be that? okay yeah, cool would be interesting yeah i feel like yeah. as an appsec engineer the green team stuff really describes like a large part of of what we do and how we sort of interface between engineers and detection response and sometimes even yeah. the red team um you know how much really of it is like doing it as well like uh, sorry to cut you off Beck. just really yeah. small, small thought uh i wonder how much of this is like doing it well as well yeah 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 um and i think it's really interesting because going to like your use the the use of secure coding practices it's really interesting because one of the problems that we see heaps in appsec and um like automated code review or code scanning is log fatigue because mm. if you don't tune your your code scanners you basically just end up bombarding either your security team or your engineers with like a whole bunch of false positives and like it's interesting because there's a lot of lessons that you can learn by going and talking to you know reliability observability dart teams about how they manage that process yeah. Um, We've been talking about this a little bit in the chat, funnily. So yeah, yeah, uh, it's very topical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I feel like green team sort of encapsulates that sort of appsec function as well. Mm -hmm. I, I got to say also, you know, before we really dug into this, I was kind of skeptical about the idea of color wheels overall, just kind of thinking I don't understand the utility of them. And I already know that blue team and red team are kind of labels that they've become a bit more known but they don't they're not really descriptive labels in themselves it's just like a color right um 
But, um, and so my feeling had always been, well, you know, if you use colors and these sorts of names, you obfuscate what we're actually talking about and it makes it harder for people to understand what you were talking about. But I think that this, like, you know, viewing this as a framework for slotting a lot of these other things in and spotting gaps in the the coverage that you've got in your practices overall as an organization or as a team or whatever is really valuable because you, you know, I think the colors have got this, um, you, you can mix colors together, like blue and yellow, making green, um, to understand what the overlap is, whether you're looking at it as a Venn diagram, whatever. In this conversation, we've thrown out lots of different other existing uh, terminology, you know, we've talked about observability, we've talked about DevSecOps, we've talked about all these things that all fit within this basket. So even if you say green team, and that doesn't have that kind of meaning to a lot of people who aren't, you know, overly familiar with frameworks like this one, I think that it really does help when you're trying to categorize the kinds of things that your organization may or may not be doing as practices, you can see where the functionality overlaps and what what's missing and I'm doing this as a tangent again I'm really sorry I just really <laughs> like it's just really hitting me at this moment kind of the utility of where um where colors can can help us plan for what we might be missing well, I'm gonna get us tangents as a service t-shirts we have to do it <laughs> Yes, like it. and James said in the chat, <laughs> you got topics, we'll derail them, all your money back. <laughs> and that just absolutely sent me. Mm-hmm. I feel like, though, this might be a controversial hot take, but I feel mm-hmm. like the color wheel is just another iteration of the agile idea of cross-functional teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, just sort of, we've just slapped colors on different functions and said we could mix them. And I I feel like I really like it because it's a really approachable way and you don't need to get into the whole agile Mm -hmm. conversation. But at the same time, I feel like we've repackaged something that engineering has known for a very long time and said this is how it applies to InfoSec. And I feel like there might be a lot of people who were around at the birth of agile going, yes. Yes, you have. <laughs> yes, this is what yeah. I was telling you before. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's not to say it's not helpful. I think sometimes retelling the story and making it more approachable is good because, I don't know, 100%. it's really hard to address agile practices sometimes with security folk. Uh, and different yeah. people understand things in different ways when they're packaged mm-hmm. up differently as well. Plus, yeah. there are infinity ways to retell something. People keep publishing romance novels even though we know how they go. They keep writing new ones. And that's not about the destination. It's about the journey, Lily. (laughs) Yes. Maybe maybe we can start like an InfoSec tropes thing as a way of like capturing some of these things. Oh, I love this. Any excuse for you to make a new wiki back? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if I want to make more bingo cards, we need an Mm -hmm. OWASP bingo card. Anyway. Anyway, so Kyle, sorry, okay. <laughs> we have we have gone on tangents again. Um, my what I, my point was was I love this slide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good uh, I, I'm a visual learner, so the, all the colors and all those things helps me, yep. you know, remember yeah, and all too. those things. Yeah, and I only just have like one slide left, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, just show this because it's like. You know, a blue team wish list. You know, like like the years. You know, uh, working in tech, and you know, then later on specializing in cybersecurity or infosec. So lagging improvements because um, how can we investigate something if we don't have logs? So logs are very important. So one of my pet peeves is that could be like there's just a log, there's just a timestamp, but you know, there's like a code number or something. Like what does that mean? You know, unless it's like a well-documented, you know, a software application and it's available out there, I don't know what that code something means, okay? So at least provide some meaningful event descriptions, okay? And then also please follow standards in terms of like, you know, uh, timestamps. Like if you could like put it like UTC, so it's easier for us, let's just say, in, in Melbourne, wherein we have, you know, the standard time and then you have daylight savings time so we just have to make sure that we understand like you know is this during daylight so it's utc plus 11 standard utc plus you know 10 and then there is a standard called i i saw 8601 
So, so it's like easier for us because you know here, like, so in terms of like you have the year, then you have the month, uh, the month, and then you have the day, and then there's the time stamps there. That's like really important, especially in terms of understanding uh, the intrusion, like in terms of because we always like do like timelining to understand what happened. Okay, and then other thing is log retention. So um, I know that um, like it used to be we talk about storage and there's you know storage is expensive, but we move we move further along like in tech that we have now you know a lot of capacity. So log retention, like you know, how long is it going to be stored locally and then you know in terms of the support for sending it to a, sys, um, a central syslog server so have those kind of you know functionalities okay and then the second point is about change management in terms of you know the naming convention so for example you release this application and then you change you know the name later on or something at least have it documented somewhere so we know that if we're like analyzing something we see this let's just say process you know what's this process name so at least we know that it's from this particular application and the directory convention so uh like put it like let's just say you put it under a particular program name and then there's like an update or something or maybe like have like a uh, maybe a different directory but at least make sure that you have the version number there so at least it's uh you know it's uh, clear to us that oh this is one of the legitimate you know uh directories mm -hmm. Okay, because if you put it under temp, it's like kind of like suspicious. Like, why would you put it under like a temp folder or something? You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so and, and and of course the documentation about what you're doing, because um, there's like you know potentially it could be several processes running. So at least we know like is this part of this application or not? And then lastly, integrity monitoring, like hash repository. So at least we have like a comparison. These are supposedly the, let's just say, the known good hash, you know, repository. So at least we can check because sometimes you have, you know, applications being renamed and all those things, but at least we have some, you know, integrity monitoring. So these are just like, you know, wish list for Defender, like talking to somebody who's uh, in the yellow team, the builders, you know. Um, I know that you have all these uh, functionalities, these requirements, and all those things. But at least, you know, help us if something's like you know uh, bad that is happening there. Understand whether it's actually uh, this application is the one causing it, or could be that you have supply chain, you know, security issue, and <laughs> you're now, you know, the update is not your good update, you know. Anyway. Oh, that's it. I personally can't wait uh, for you to get a deal with like No Starch or something to publish and flesh out this wish list as yeah. like almost like a, a starter pack for uh, yeah. teams that don't have the uh, maybe the uh, skill sets available to them to know what what they don't have. Um, Develop a starter pack to get on security yeah. side. From from the AppSec side, can I also add to this wish list, guy? Please, sure. please, for the love of God, stop logging your secrets and yeah. oh, God. <laughs> we want you to log it, but not please. Like, please. But how else do I know what the secret was when I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. yes. Thank you for saying that because I've actually <laughs> seen logs with like you know the Haven't username and password in clear text. Haven't Thank you. The thing is, like, logging is important, but I have seen <laughs> some interesting logs where I'm like, why are you logging this? And no one can tell me. Like do you need this information for anything? No, we just turned it on. Just in case you for debugging. Why are we debugging with secrets anyway? Like, it's just so that we know what they are. Mm -hmm. So we know what secret bet. made the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of thing I think where it can be really helpful to uh, actually even I think there's something that's really good about this show where we talk about this kind of stuff because maybe the the context isn't super clear to yeah. um, some developers who don't have a security background like why that's a bad idea when you approach it from a purely functionality basement like I'm joking but I'm also like haha only serious because um, I could also see people taking that view like if I've written code that validates a certain bit of functionality um, the secrets being passed into that functionality might actually be a really useful part of diagnosing the problem 
um, yeah. more quickly. So it's about, I think, providing resources that are accessible um, so that people see why that's maybe uh, going to cause more problems than it will solve. Yeah. Yeah, and I yeah. think there's like there's things that we as security and we go back to like talking about security being cops and like telling people like this is the way you should do it and yeah. not understanding like why someone's doing it. There is merit in in security, you know, going to the builders and saying, okay, tell me, talk to me about why it is that you're doing this or what do you need? What's your end goal? Because if the mm -hmm. end goal is something like, oh, um, you know, a user makes a request and I want to log that so that I know for when the user raises a support ticket, um, I'm logging their email address. Well, we might say to them, have you considered logging their like unique ID instead, instead of their email address, because that's bad, you know, just things like that. Just throwing something um, up on the screen there, which mm -hmm. I think is a good point. No, that's a really I'd good agree. comment. Yep, yep, like, yep. I think that that's, I think that <laughs> I've been there when I used to do games development. Um, I used to be like, just make it work. I don't care if it's secure mm -hmm. or not. I want it to work. And if it works, then I've passed my assignment. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I think this is that, like that needs to be part of the assignment, you know? Yeah. Well, this is also why I say that it's really invaluable if people who go into security in any form have had some experience in building software in some way mm -hmm. to have that mindset. Right. They're totally different mm -hmm. mindsets. It's very hard to hold both in your head at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the mindset of let's build something, let's make it work, you're probably not thinking about all of this other stuff. And that's valid. Yeah. So understanding where people come from, I think, is a really important way of being able to respond to this and say, hey, mm -hmm. we have all of these things going wrong. And instead of going, well, you're just stupid for having done that, understanding mm -hmm. that they just had a different mm -hmm. mindset at that point in time. And that for them, that is a valid way of doing things to accomplish what they want to achieve. Yeah, it is, they have outcome. It, it oh, is yes. really funny. Oh, sorry. I'll let you go. No, no, no. It's okay. Go. It's okay. Go. Go away. <laughs> I was just going to say, I know that there have been heaps of times where I've had conversations with engineers and I'll be like, all right, so, you know, walk me through the decision that led to this outcome. Like, just just tell me. I'm going to sit here. I'm just going to listen. I won't make faces or say anything. Just And they'll tell me and you get to the end and you're just like, I would have made the exact same decision. And mm -hmm. I have no idea how we're going to solve this because this is such a big, complicated problem, and there, like, there, are every every person is a stakeholder in this, and mm -hmm. basically, like, this wasn't the right decision, but also you didn't actually make this decision. It was made, you know, mm -hmm. fifteen years ago when someone decided on a particular tech stack or a particular pattern, and you know, I I think we all sit around and we're like, ha ha, mm -hmm. don't log secrets, but also. Yeah. Sometimes it just happens and it really I feel sucks. like I'm just going to leave that comment up, Lily. Yeah, yeah for, for sure. That, that, was, for that, that was like the point that I was um, going to say. Like, you may not have, let's just say, experience in that particular area of tech and all those things, but, you know, you talk to people and then ask them questions and then listen because uh, they do have a lot to share and then listen mm. to them because uh, sometimes, you know, you come in like gung-ho, no, no, it's like this. And, and that's like a challenging thing for me in security because it's always like we're, they think of like we're the guards, you know, like yeah. the enforce, enforcers and all those things. It's kind Internet of Internet mall cops. <laughs> yes. That's like the official the, title. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the cops it's or so something. True. I think some people yeah. have like a superiority like complex about it as well. And this is why like when I first started getting into security, I was scared. I gatekept myself because I was like, you know, some of these Lead some yourself. of these people are like, you know, I don't know how to explain it. It's very like like you were saying, Beck, it's very black and white. It's very like this is mm. the way things need to be done. And if you mm. don't do it this way, you're a dumbass, basically. Yeah. Um, and I think just having like a more diverse cast of team members. The person mm -hmm. who's the guardian, the person who's the empath, we can all combine our forces and get the best outcome. I think, I think, yeah, you I think this can be summarized as security is meant to be mutual aid, not policing. Hell yeah, I love it. And this that. comes back yeah. to the traditional core values of the Death yep. show. At least the Australian are. Yeah, we need to. All right understand where people are coming from what their concerns yeah. are and yeah. that actually helps us understand you know um what happened or you know why the practice is like that mm -hmm. yeah 
For sure. Well, thank you so much. We are quickly running out of time. So thanks for having a chat with us. I hope we have recruited some blue teamers there in the the audience or otherwise just given developers a nice little laundry list of nice things they could do to make our lives easier. Um, And, you know, maybe you had a little art lesson, learned how to mix some colours, I for one did. Um, Please stay tuned to everybody um, on Twitter or on Twitch or on YouTube. Uh, We'll be basically posting announcements of when our next shows are. Um, So until then, stick around and keep an eye out for updates. And we'll see you next time. Bye, Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you too.